Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. It's time to have a look at the suggestions past developers for February of 2023. This time we're finishing the series for February on the ground vehicles. There's a lot of cool stuff in this one, uh, which is why I saved the best to last, and always why it's nice to look at. Anyway, if you enjoy this type of content, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and also like the video. Let's get into it. The first vehicle is for America, and it's the XM66D. The XM66 Ancestry dates back to the unsuccessful T95 medium tank, which was intended to replace the M48 pattern. The main improvements of the T95 series over the M48, a smoothbore gun and an X-shaped diesel engine, both failed to meet standards, so the tank was cancelled and the simpler M60 quickly developed and adopted instead. This simplicity left something to be desired for the US brass, who still dreamed of a more advanced MBT. So an upgrade program was begun, designated the M60E1. Through this tank, which was adopted as the M60A1, one part of the T95 survived its cancellation, which was its turret. When the 90mm smoothbore had failed, the T95E1 turret had been adapted for a conventional 105mm gun, as the T95E7. This better angled turret design was a perfect fit for the new M60E1, with some modifications, and it would see further development in the XM66. While the US was developing the M60E1, upgrade for the M60, they were also seriously considering their next stage of tank development, drawing up plans which they called the MBTMR, the XM81 gun launcher, then in development, was the planned main armament, and while the program as a whole wasn't a high priority, testing the weapon on a medium tank chassis was something they were interested in. It seems the first platform for the XM81 was the T95 medium tank, which by the early 1960s had become the US's primary test chassis. A T95 E7 turret was modified to house uh, the driver, who, like the MBT-70s, had his own counter-rotating cupola, had its bustle also shortened and fitted with the T81E6 gun. This was mounted on the hull of the T95E8, an engine testbed tank which had previously used an M48 turret. At the time, the E8TR gun launcher was apparently only firing conventional rounds. This is likely a result of two factors. One, the T95E8 test rig was one of the first vehicles to mount the gun, so there was no rush to test the missile aspect, and two, the Shillelagh missile had a long development cycle and probably wasn't ready for the T95E8 when it was built. While the MBT MR's driver and turret concept and overall shape would eventually return to the MBT-70, the closest thing to an MBT MR prototype the US ever built, for many years after the T95E8TR, the development of a gun launcher MBT took a less ambitious form. The further the project, four turret designs were drawn up, designated the XM66. Turrets A and B were low-profile designs and would eventually become the M60A2 turret. Turret C was styled after the M551's turret but remained a mock-up and turret D was a mod modified T95E7 slash E8 turret. The three XM66 prototypes were based on the M48 hull, and though both the M60 XM66 B and D turrets were later tested on the M60 chassis, as the M60E2 and M60A1E1, and also M60A3, it seems only turret D was fitted to the M48 based XM66. Unfortunately, there's no source that actually explains why this, is why this is the case, but it's very likely that the D turret, which was just a simple conversion of existing T95 turrets, took less time to develop than the notoriously high-tech B turret, and also, as a result, was available for early M48 prototypes as well as later uh, M60s. None of these later tanks had the XM66 designation, only their turrets, so it's possible that the entire M48-based vehicle was called XM66, and the turrets kept the name for ease of reference, in the same way that it's convenient to call the M6120's turret an Abrams turret. The XM66 seems to have fallen by the wayside pretty quickly, though, the M60-based variants clearly being the better option. And as a result, their place in history is mostly forgotten. 
The M60E2 and M60E3 were trialled simultaneously, but at the end, the low-profile turret B of the M60E2 won out, and the vehicle was renamed the M60A1E1 after the M60E1's adoption. The M60A1E1 was eventually produced as the advanced but troubled M60A2 Starship, but the vehicle's lacklustre performance saw it leave service not long after it entered. While the US continued to seek the MBT-MR ideal uh, with Germany through the joint effort of the MBT-70, this tank, even more advanced but even more troubled, was the closest the US would ever get to an MBT-MR, as rising costs and Germany's abandonment of the project forced US tank designers towards a new direction. Though better known, the MBT-70 ultimately saw no more active service than the XM-66 did a decade previously leaving both tanks to the realm of what-ifs, and of course, the virtual battlefield. Moving on to Britain, we have the mobile 4-inch anti-tank gun. While Britain was rebuilding its armour after the Dunkirk evacuation, roughly 49 trucks had BL 4-inch Mark 7 naval guns mounted as part of the Emergency Coastal Defence Battery. They arrived in July of 1940, and several were assigned to the 164th Infantry Brigade in the area of Aldebra and also Benneke. One gun was located to the west of Salawood Covert to defend the two roads leading inland from Walberswick. According to war documents, the plan for these units was to fire all six guns, then to retreat roughly five miles inland if attacked. The cannon is an ex-Navy BL 4-inch Mark 7 mounted on a Foden 10-ton 6x4 truck. In order to accommodate the large gun, uh, the top of the cab was completely removed, leaving the driver and passengers completely exposed, along with the rest of the crew of six. Not much is known about what happened to these unique anti-tank guns. None survived the war, and documentation on them is pretty difficult to find. The next suggestion is a simple one, and it's for the Imperial Japanese Army vehicles to get the smoke launcher modifications. There's a bunch of vehicles that in history did have access to smoke launchers. Uh, the post specifically talks about the Type 95 Ha Go, the Type 97 Chi Ha, and the Type 97 Chi Ha Kai. Uh, basically, all of these actually did have smoke launchers on them. The Ha Go, obviously the Ha Go Commander, has access um, to the uh, smoke launchers, but the idea is to add it to the actual standard Hago in the tree. The Chi Ha, in reality, had four launcher racks on the roof of the vehicle, uh, which uh, also had two launchers on the fenders uh, as well, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then also, uh, the Chi Ha Kai uh, had access to side turret launchers as well, and also a roof-mounted smoke launcher in a different model compared to the Chi Ha and the Ha Go one. China gets the BW120K, and I just want to read the first paragraph verbatim of this thing before we get into the post, because I think it's quite funny. Welcome to the suggestion post for the BW120K. This is a rather mysterious and yet fa fascinating Type 59 variant that uses a 120mm smoothbore gun in a similar fashion to the Leopard A1A1 with the Rheinmetall L44 gun. Due to its mysterious nature, you may find many instances of certain parts of this vehicle being debated, or just unknown. If you have any 100% verifiable information on this, including sources, pictures, or other forms of evidence, I would highly appreciate you commenting it in a respectful manner. Now then, let's see what we know about the vehicle and its background. This was from 2020, by the way. Originally created as a licensed T-54A copy, the Type 59 saw a long life with the People's Liberation Army. During its service life, the Type 59 saw massive success, both in China and abroad. In the 1970s, the Type 59 began to have a lot of upgrades to improve its capabilities and extend its service life. Technology from the West began to come in due to a warming in relations, and the first major upgrade using this technology was the Type 59-2. The 2 was first adopted in 1984, and used a lot of new technology that had never been seen in service with the PLA, including the 105mm L7 derived gun, a British Marconi fire control system, modern APFSDS-T ammunition, and much more. 
But even with the Type 59 II and subsequent variants, Norinco wanted to take the Type 59 design further. Beginning in the 90s, Norinco created a modified Type 59 II using a 120mm smoothbore gun primarily as a testbed. The reasoning for this testbed seems to be debated, with most sources claiming it was for export, but some claiming it was to test the feasibility of a larger gun on the Type 59 chassis. Beforehand, the idea of using a 125mm gun had been proposed, but on the first and second generation tanks like the Type 59, the autoloader would not fit in the tank, and the breech itself would make the turret too cramped. As such, Norinco settled for the 120mm gun, a caliber already in service on the PTZ-89. However, there is some debate still over the gun's origin. When revealed at a Norinco weapons exhibition in 97, the gun used a thermal sleeve, and had a chrome-lined barrel to extend barrel life, but since the vehicle was likely intended for export, inside not much was changed. In spite of this, auxiliary systems such as the radio set, generator for the engine, and the interior layout were changed. The fire control system became more sophisticated. However, including a day-night sight, the vehicle also introduced two-plane stabilization, a periscope for the commander, and possibly a laser rangefinder. The APFS-DS round developed by Norinco used a semi-combustible cartridge case uh, with the weight of the shell including the Sabo being 7.33 kilos and the weight of the core being 4.1. The muzzle velocity is reported to be about 1660 meters per second and the penetration of 1500 meters against an RHA equivalent target being 550 millimeters. The turret can rotate 360 degrees and the barrel has elevation angles of minus 5 to plus 18. However, as with many tank projects, the ambitious Type 59 variant was not adopted by the People's Liberation Army. The uh, fate of the vehicle, or vehicles, is unknown. Uh, but it would not be the end of the Type 59, as a number of countries and China itself managed to later outfit the Type 59 with 125mm guns, such as the Type 59G and also the Type 59 Durjoy. For Italy, you get a box. This is the Ansaldo Caro de Salto 5T Modelo 36. Uh, this was a modernization of the CV-33 in the prospect of exporting the tanks abroad. The Ansaldo Caro de Salto Modelo 36 was in overall a turreted CV-33-35 with real anti-tank capacity. The base of the tank was a CV-33 with a higher casemate and a machine gun turret. The engine was mostly unchanged as well as the suspension and transmission. The frontal armour was raised to 30mm to provide a decent protection against anti-tank guns while not being too heavy. The turret mounted a 37mm L26 gun on which, unfortunately, there isn't a ton of data. The tank was uh, built and tested in the late 1936 with decent results. It was soon offered for exports as an upgraded version of the CV-35, but it had little interest on the international market. Uh, the LTVZ-35 and R-35 along with the Vickers 6 tons and T-26 were actually seen as better tanks of the same class already on the market. The Ansaldo Caro Cannon Model 36, which was a sister design, which uh, did actually draw interest for the Italian army, uh, which was looking for a new light tank in 1938. The uh, Ansaldo Caro de Salto Modelo 36 was used as the basis of the L640 development, mounting a newer M38 turret and also a more powerful engine. The French get the Giet VAB Vader. This was designed to offer close support to the mobile armor divisions. The design remained only a prototype, but was successfully tested with its main purpose being to counter low-flying aircraft such as the Mi-24 Hind. The choice was made that uh, missiles were more suitable for the job, so that's why this one never really went further. The VAB Vader was a prototype made in the mid-70s and equipped with two 20mm F2 cannons with 500 rounds per gun in the SAMM GTS turret with EMD-20 radar mounted on a 6x6 VAB chassis. The uh, crew 
was three members. The actual prototype was later refitted with 12.7mm MGs and the radar was removed after the concept was dropped in the mid-70s. The armoured car is actually currently in the Samour Museum of Tanks in France and also still in working condition, surprisingly. I apologize to any Swedish vehicle, but your language is literally written by aliens. This is the Panzer van Spjadsterangbil 9031, or the PVP JT GB 9031. This was a light unarmored terrain vehicle, which was based uh, from the transport version of said vehicle, aka the personal Lasterangbil 903, which were introduced in the 60s. Compared to the transport version, this uh, version had its chassis modified to accommodate the Bofors 9cm Panzerwarmdias 1110. Uh, however, the other reason for this uh, was due to previous tests, in which they tried to deploy the gun onto a more conventional PLTGB 903, but during the testing, they realized that there is a high risk of the recoil flame of the cannon would set the rear part of the vehicle on fire. The solution came with a new chassis from Volvo, which gave the vehicle a much lower profile and also less total weight compared to its original counterpart, which caused the uh, vehicle to have a much higher max speed, which was not intended to have originally. There were several accidents which occurred with the PVP JTGB 9031, which is due to the lighter weight and the cannon mounted on the vehicle. Mainly, it was prone to flip, if you're driving too fast and are suddenly having to hard brake. Alternatively, if you're driving the vehicle on a steep angle. Due to the cannon mounted onto the vehicle, it increased the total weight to the front of the vehicle, which will cause the overall weight distribution to go to the front, rather than the center. After several of these accidents occurred with the vehicle, the Swedish Armed Forces decided to modify the PVP JTGB 9031 to accommodate a foldable roll bar onto the vehicle to reduce injuries to the crew and vehicle itself. The reason why it was foldable is so that the crew can aim and fire the cannon in a much broader angle, compared if the roll bar was a fixed object. The last vehicle is for Israel, and it is the Tehran 5S Samovar. This was a modern T-55 with some M48 parts. The tank is not just another T-55 with a new gun. This tank is actually much more. The tank went into a full modernization by the IDF, with the first uh, modernization aimed to improve the mobility. The original T-55 engine caused Israel a lot of trouble with the maintenance of it. It was getting worn out, and they uh, thought that it would be a good idea to just change it. They installed the Teledyne Continental Diesel Engine, the 8V71T Instant, uh, this engine developing 609 horsepower, it was a decent improvement over the original 550 horsepower engine. But not only the engine was changed, but also the transmission. The tank received a new semi-automatic hydro-mechanical power transmission with a torque converter. This meant that the gearbox had a low and high regime for each speed. Um, it also uh, meant that gear shifting was a lot smoother and also uh, meant that you can uh, basically have five forward speeds and one backward, um, but technically it was more like ten forward and two backwards. After modernizing the mobility, the Israelis went to modernize the turret. The turret received a new storage basket on the rear and a new flat top commander's cupola taken from the M48 pattern. But not only was the turret changed, the firepower was also improved. The tank received the 105mm M48 gun with a new fire control to allow it to fire M111 APFSDS. The site received a new day-night camera um, with new laser rangefinder, new stabilization, and overall the firepower was just more effective. To improve the protection, the tank also offered some Blazer ERA armor which was greatly improving the protection against heat. The tank also had a dozen of smaller improvements that uh, would turn up around. But unfortunately, uh, even though this is a decent modernization of the T-55, Israel didn't adopt it. This modification was made in 1983, and back then, the Makava 2 was entering service, and the Macaque was slowly taking the place of reserve tanks. 
So the Turan, that was still in service with the Israelis, was slowly being sold, and only the Turan 6 remained in service a little more. The IDF probably just didn't see an interest in upgrading a tank which was already at the end of its service life. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Millie Draper, Juan the Panda, Nick R. Kupila, Carrion Crow, Gus Irenicus, Pyman, Merciless Reaper, Orange Tail, Teddy, Daniel Stanton, Moxie B. Young, Peter Grayling, Jerry Provolt, Bereen, Alan Hacker, Sem Arslan, Uncle Bean, Derek R., and Lafouche for supporting the channel.